capitalism or communism. These days, if you ask anybody of the internet for their opinion on them, they will either tell you that it is the worst thing humanity has ever created and its only use is to enslave the masses into complacency, or they are going to tell you that it is the best thing that could have ever happened to us and is the only way to run a civilized society. But both kinds of people will tell you that the other one is an idiot or evil. Even still, which one of them is right? I think the truth, as always, lies somewhere in the middle. If we were to ask for the opinion of Winston Churchill, democracy is the worst form of government, except for all those other forms that have been tried. We have to keep in mind that when Churchill said this, Europe was just done with World War II and the topic of how we should run a society was still very hotly debated at the time. Well, it seems that today it still is. It has been almost 8 decades since the famous quote was uttered and we as a species have gotten a lot of time to learn about ourselves in a modern world and try out our theories about how we should run society. But we still don't seem to get any closer to actually finding an answer. What if we are looking in the wrong place? Usually, when people talk about capitalism, they look to Western Europe or the USA. And when it comes to socialism, they look to the East, to the former USSR and China. As I've said before, perhaps the answer lies somewhere in the middle. Central and Eastern Europe, as well as most of the Balkans, are in the unique position that they have been through both communism and capitalism, so we can look at their results in order to make a fair comparison. So, communist, capitalism and the transition. How do they shape up? In order to answer this question, we must go back a few decades to the late 1940s. After the end of the war, a good part of the entire continent consisted of smoking piles of rubble and ash, and this was especially true for Eastern Europe. The Western Allies wanted to finally have some peace and begin rebuilding the war-torn countries. This initiative was going to become known as the Marshall Plan, where the United States allocated the equivalent of 173 billion US dollars for the restoration of the infrastructure and industries destroyed during the war. Unfortunately, not every European country was in the position to accept such an offer. The countries that were soon to fall under Soviet influence were forced to refuse the aid from the United States because the US were already shaping up to become the main rival of the communist bloc and they wanted to prove to them that centrally planned socialist type economies could outgrow the West without their help. At the end of World War II, when the Soviet troops were done with Germany, they wanted to make sure that they would receive reparations for the damage suffered during the invasion and they did not care from whom or how they got it. The retreating Red Army pillaged their way back to Moscow throughout the entire Eastern Europe, stealing people's property and resources such as coal, grain and industrial equipment from the factories. Western Europe was already getting a head start in the recovery process compared to their neighbors to the east. This disparity in relationship with their patron superpower was a deciding factor, irrespective of whether they had a communist government or not. But the Soviet Union was not satisfied with only pillaging and annexing land from their western neighbors. They also wanted to make sure that they instated puppet regimes in each Warsaw Pact country so that they would have a buffer zone between themselves and the west, in case of a potential future future armed conflict. The political process was fairly simple. Create a coalition of left-wing and anti-fascist parties, arrest or convert any political opponent, and ensure the supremacy of the communist party within the government. Moscow had a varying degree of difficulty with the implementation of this strategy in every soon-to-be communist satellite state, but the outcome was pretty much always the same. Let's see some examples. Hungarians fiercely opposed the Soviet takeover. The communists received only 17% of the votes during the first free election and forced the Soviets to heavy-handedly intervene in their politics. They they persecuted dissidents using the secret police, and they repeatedly forced small concessions from each opposing party until the Communist Party became the sole power in the state. On the other hand, the process of transition to communists happened much more smoothly in other states. Albania, for instance, was already led by the Communist Party even before the war had ended. Their Communist Party, named the National Liberation Movement, contributed to the liberation of the capital Tirana from the German occupiers. This offered them the political support to quickly rise to power. They wasted no time and started consolidating their position, as well as isolating the country from any western nation. At the same time, they began strengthening their ties with other communist states, in particular Yugoslavia. At this point, the war weary west simply stood by and watched this process unfold in one country after the other, in fear that any intervention might trigger an armed conflict with the Soviet Union. Nobody wanted to start another world war after the last one just ended, so the freedom of Eastern Europe was the price that had to be paid for world peace. Again, Churchill famously commented that an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Now that the communist regimes were set in place, they began implementing their policies in order to shape the countries according to Leninist values. Even before the end of the Second World War, most East European countries had already had a communist party within their government, which exerted varying levels of influence. If the Soviet Union approved of the leader of such nation, they would offer them support in order to strengthen their position. An example of this occurrence 
was in 1943 Czechoslovakia, when their leader in exile, Edvard Beneš, proposed a set of policies that appealed to Stalin, such as the expulsion from the country of over 1 million ethnic Germans and Hungarians, and the nationalization of large landowners' property in the likes of factories, mines and steelworks. But more often than not, what actually happened in the majority of these nations was that Stalin simply decided that if you want something done right, you must do it yourself, so he straight up appointed a candidate from a communist party in order to rule the nation. The Soviet Union then offered their support to the Communist Party, such as persecuting their political opponents through arrests, intimidation, imprisonment and interfering with public elections because they wanted to make sure that their candidate wins. An instance of this occurring was in 1944 Romania, who was fighting alongside the Axis at the time. King Mihai I noticed that the war was going rather poorly, so he decided to switch sides and join the Allies. He threw his support behind the underground Communist Resistance Party and overthrew the fascist military dictator Ion Antonescu. Soon after, the Soviet Red Army occupied the country and forced the King Mihai to instate a government led by the Communist Party and their representative Petru Broza. They then proceeded to stack the ministries with communist supporters and issue policies in line with Leninist governing principles, while completely disregarding the king's authority, who was eventually forced to flee the country and live in exile until the eventual revolution. The economical and cultural shifts brought on by communists had both positive and negative aspects for the people. One of the most implemented policies throughout the Warsaw Pact nations was the seizure of land from wealthy citizens and Nazi sympathizers. The seized land was given originally to the farmers who previously owned very little. In the Transylvania region of Romania, as many as 800,000 farmers had received the land that was previously owned by the local ethnic Germans who were stripped of all their belongings. This practice did not happen everywhere in the communist bloc, nor did it last forever where it did, as the seized land from the bourgeoisie was often nationalized and turned into collective farms. Or the nationalization happened later, when the farmers did not comply with the commands of the central committee by planting whatever they wanted on their land instead of the crops directly imposed by the state. Another economic decision that was widely enforced was the nationalization of the country's means of production. This meaning factories, power plants and generally any privately owned business. The management of these institutions was replaced with worker councils and communist representatives who were tasked with running the facilities in accordance to Leninist economical principles. This usually meant fulfilling the production quotas imposed by the central committee, instead of being driven by market trends and profit seeking like a regular company would be. The communist nations of Eastern Europe also tended to favor heavy industry instead of consumer goods and services. This led to the rapid industrialization of the countries that may have otherwise lagged behind their western peers, and basically forced them to step into a modern day type of economy. But it also inevitably impacted the quality of life for the people because it reduced the supply for the goods and services that they would normally consume. This change also drove citizens to move into the cities for factory jobs and contributed to the economic disparities between the urban and rural areas of Eastern Europe that can still be noticed to this day. The Soviet Union was heavily involved in the governing of its communist satellite state. But a series of events that transpired in the 1950s, as well as some changes in the Soviet approach to foreign policy, were about to stir the hearts and minds of the people. The death of Stalin in 1953 and the overly brutal intervention of the Soviets during the 1956 citizen revolt in Budapest, where the Russian army bombed the city and opened fire on civilians, gave motive to the people to ask for reforms in the direction of democracy, liberalization and free markets. The best known example of this incident was the Prague Spring in 1963. The Prague Spring was the culmination of a reformist movement, which was supported by a wide array of factions that was suppressed through military intervention by the Soviet Union, who feared that this would compromise the communist ideals that bound the Easter bloc to its will. This will become a common theme among these countries until the eventual collapse of the Soviet Union. The people call for liberalization and democratic reforms, and Moscow squashes the initiative, either by political or military intervention. This is likely the reason why all anti-communist revolutions promptly took place once the Soviet Union showed that it was weak enough so that it wouldn't be intervene. Without the support from Moscow, the communist dictators were too afraid to stand in the way of their people's desire for reform. In Romania, the dictator in 1989, Nicolae Ceausescu, refused to step down from power once the citizens began to protest and it led to a bloody revolution that ended with the execution of the dictator and his wife on the Christmas day of the same year. When it comes to economics, the communist nations of Eastern Europe in the second half of the 20th century weren't doing so well. The main issue of socialist economies are the same ones as in a capitalist monopoly, because that's essentially what they are. Nationwide monopolies on every market. Any product or service provider is naturally discouraged to provide any higher quality goods or services than it is absolutely forced to by the market. This is because quality is expensive, time consuming and difficult to obtain. Let's say that you want to open a barber shop in a capitalist economy. Even before you open your doors for the first time, there are questions that you must answer correctly in order to have a chance to be successful. Where should you open the barber shop? Are there any others nearby? What price should you charge for a haircut? How many customers do you need to cover your experience.
expenses. You can go on like this for a while, and if you answer any of these questions incorrectly, you are likely to fail. And it is going to be your money and your time that was wasted, so you have a vested interest in doing well. On the other hand, if you were to manage a barbershop in a communist economy, you would be under far less pressure to attract and satisfy customers. The biggest expense would be the wage of the employees, and this would be covered by the state. You would never have to negotiate the wages, as they are already set in a government-issued document, and they only increase with experience and certifications. The employee turnover would also probably be extremely low, because all barbershops pay the same. There is also the thing that it was basically impossible to get fired, so the only requirement was to show up. The management would also have no reason to try and improve their service quality or price, because as long as they can pass a state inspection or audit, they can be confident that they will keep their jobs and establishment open. This principle can be applied to any and all aspects of a communist centrally planned economy, with the notable exception of the industries that the state had a particularly vested interest in, such as the space race, where the USSR outperformed the US for the majority of its duration, and nuclear armament, where by the time it fell, the Soviet Union built almost twice as many nukes as the USA. This goes to show that impressive results can be obtained by institutions within a communist economy, as long as the participants actually have a vested interest in their own success, in this case having the Central Committee keeping a close eye on their work. But not all sides of communist economies were doing just as well. If you want a modern example, you can look at the market monopolies in a capitalist economy. This is a service that centralizes the sale of tickets to events. Its purpose is to prevent scalpers from buying up all the tickets and then selling them to the population at an obscene profit. The effects of state-imposed monopolies in communist economies compounds over time. So between the end of World War II and the fall of the Soviet Union, the disparities between the East and the West have grown to significant proportions. One of the lesser-known problems was the difficulty of the communist states in implementing computer technology within their processes, such as manufacturing, services, or administrative work. Although computers would greatly increase the quality and productivity of these institutions, and honestly become what they are today, their implementation would be very complicated, both from a technological and societal point of view. First of all, good computers are hard to build, especially in the 1980s, so at the start they would face supply problems, even if there were a strong push for digitalization. The next step would have been to implement computers into the industrial equipment and processes by redesigning both of them. This again would be an incredibly complicated and expensive process. Then there is the problem of getting people to actually use them. Many of us had had computers and phones throughout our lives, so using them came naturally to us. But imagine trying to get an entire society, and especially a bureaucratic state apparatus, to get to learn how to use a 1980s computer which worked by using command prompts. To this day, most East European state bureaucracies still struggle to embrace digitalization, and they mostly function by using pen and paper. The benefits of digitalization force the Western economies to overcome the hurdles of its implementation, because of the threat of competition. You simply cannot afford to have a competitor producing parts 10 times more precise than yours, because they use a computer control machine and you don't. Another issue was that communist countries lacked the incentives to rush the implementation of computers within their processes, because as opposed to companies which operated in a free market, they did not fear being left behind by their competitors. These societal, economical and political problems all culminated at the end of the 1990s when the communist regime started to fall in Eastern Europe. Some of the People's Republics consequently fragmented into the European nations that we know today, such as the Balkans, Czechia, Slovakia, the Baltic States, Ukraine, Belarus and Moldova. Most governments had the sense to give up power peacefully, with a few exceptions such as the previously mentioned Romanian tyrant, who decided that he would rather die than listen to the will of his people. And again, most formerly communist nations were wise enough to ban former members of the party from joining politics after the revolution or appearing on television or radio. But there were some exceptions to this, like again Romania, who ended up being led by the same communist party officials that turned coat and joined the revolution once they saw that the fight wasn't going their way. Maybe this was historic retribution for World War II. But alas, the people of Eastern Europe have finally received what they have been asking for for about half a century, democracy, liberalism and free markets. But we have to keep in mind that these results have never been a foregone conclusion. After the dust has settled and the communist regimes were overthrown, there was a power vacuum left in the governing structures of said nations. The countries could have arguably just as easily turned into religious theocracies instead of democracies, just like Saudi Arabia or Iran. Or the army could have staged a coup and instated a military dictatorship which proceeded to start wars against their neighbors for the disputed territories. An example of this timeline taking place is in the Yugoslav Wars, when the Federation of Western Balkan states started to dissolve into independent countries. Ethnic and national tensions reached a boiling point between the former Yugoslav states and war broke out. This was the largest armed conflict since the Second World War that happened between sovereign nations in Europe and its brutality left the continent in shock. The United Nations and NATO had to intervene due to rising incidents of ethnic cleansing taking place within the regions populated by minorities, and to this day, several commanders involved in the conflict have been tried and condemned for committing war crimes. In the aftermath of the collapse of USSR and Yugoslavia, 
Yugoslavia, the majority of the formerly communist countries have joined NATO in order to gain protection from eventual acts of aggression from their former overlords, and also because of the pro-Western sentiment developed by the population during the transition to democracy. The following decade after the revolution was wrought with economic distress and political uncertainty in the Eastern Europe and the Balkans. The term that is generally used to describe the transition from a socialist centrally planned economy to a free market capitalist one is called shock therapy. The fitting name refers to the sweeping economic and political reforms that are adopted during this period, which are often the complete opposite of what used to be considered the norm before. From a social perspective, perhaps one of the most impactful change was that now the citizens who used to live behind the Iron Curtain had access to Western media and products, as well as the ability to visit or even move to those countries. Before the anti-communist revolution, owning or consuming any piece of Western media was illegal and will land you in prison or even worse, much in the same way as it is in North Korea at the moment. Many people took advantage of this newfound freedom and emigrated en masse to Western countries in the hopes of building a better future for themselves and their families. To this day, formerly communist states have some of the largest emigrant populations in the world and the process is ongoing, leading to an economical phenomenon called brain drain. The term refers to the best performing citizens of a country moving to a richer nation in order to find better pay and living conditions, and it is a critical factor in the social and economical disparity between the east and west of Europe, and generally any other country around the world which suffers from this phenomenon. When it comes to the economy, the most significant factor is that now people, as well as companies, were forced to participate in an open market and consider all the factors that I have previously mentioned in the barbershop example. Their products and services were simply not competitive with the ones produced in the West. By that point, communist countries had only traded amongst themselves and they produced similar low quality products, but the people more or less consumed them because they had no other choice. That is if their use was not already mandated by the central committee. This meant that the formerly state-owned companies had to adapt to the new market conditions and do it fast, but these enterprises had little experience when it came to concepts such as sales and marketing. Up until this point, they had only had experience in negotiating with politicians and state administrators. In order to succeed, they needed outside help, and this meant foreign investors. Unfortunately for the companies, they were at the mercy of government policy when it came to accepting foreign investment, and this is where the divide between the newly democratic nations begins to widen. The economic transition process went again more smoothly for some countries than others. Nations like Poland were open to letting foreign investors take a share into their previously state-owned companies in order to adapt their products and match the quality standards of the West. A contributing factor to this kind of approach was that the population had already accepted reformist leaders, such as the finance minister at the time, Lezek Balcerowicz. Among the goals that he set to achieve were to control the rampant inflation, which were a widespread problem among the post-communist states, make the Polish currency convertible into other currencies at the market rate, seize subsidization for state enterprises, and remove restrictions on foreign trade. All these policies proved to be effective and allowed the Polish economy to navigate relatively smoothly the decade of turmoil that most of their peers were subjected to. An example for where the transition did not go as well was again Romania. Romanians did not take well to the proposition of foreign investors coming into their country. A particularity of the latter half of the communist regime in Romania was a strong sense of nationalism. The dictator, Nicolae Ceausescu, was highly popular at the time he gained power because he openly condemned the invasion of Czechoslovakia by the other Warsaw Pact countries during the Prague Spring. This is why nationalism was woven into the communist values of the nation and they apparently still held strong even after the revolution. When the topic of foreign investment appeared on the political scene, one of the popular slogans of the people who protested against it was we do not sell our country. This attitude delayed the transformation of the state-owned industries by several years and it forced the government to keep subsidizing them in order to preserve jobs. This in turn led to massive overspending by the state which they thought to solve by printing money that inevitably led to runaway inflation. In the late 1990s it got so bad that people's lifelong savings were becoming worthless overnight. This drove them to spend every bit of money that they had in order to try and get anything that would at least partially hold its value such as cars, TVs or even jeans. The troubles of the population did not end there. When they finally decided to stop subsidizing and privatize the massive inefficient state companies, they split the shares of ownership and gave them to the employees so they could have a long-term investment in the company's well-being. Sounds good, on paper. In reality, these shares were worthless because the companies stood no chance of competing in an open market, because of how reliant they had become on state subsidies in order to continue their activity. And most of them filed for bankruptcy soon after the privatization. The population had also been tricked into investing in multiple Ponzi schemes, a form of financial fraud, where the scammer promises outrageous returns for investors, but in actuality, all that they are doing is lending money from one investor to another until they finally decide that they have enough and take off with all the money. The largest Ponzi scheme in the history of the country was called Caritas, which ironically is the Latin word for charity. It is estimated that at one point it held over a third of all the paper money in circulation in Romania. People were coming with suitcases full of money to deposit into the fraudulent investment fund because the scammer Iwan Stoica managed to convince even the mayor of Cluj, the city where their headquarters was, to vouch publicly for them and even offered free office spaces in order to run their operations. Needless to say, the inevitable had happened. And Iwan Stoica took off 
with the life savings of millions of Romanians. But he was eventually caught by the state authorities and received a prison sentence of only one and a half years. The insane thing is, is that before Caritas, Ponzi schemes were not even illegal in Romania due to the aforementioned lack of fiscal experience and corruption of the government. The economies of Eastern Europe and the Balkans follow a pretty similar pattern of growth and decline, starting from the anti-communist revolution until the present. The general trend is the following. At first, you see slow or stagnant growth during the 1990s and early 2000s because of all the aforementioned common problems such as runaway inflation, corruption, poor governance and inefficient industries. During the following decade, a majority of the nations in question have joined the European Union. This brought on a period of rapid growth for these economies for a variety of reasons. First of all, in order to even be considered for EU membership, candidate countries must fulfill a set of requirements that encourage responsible management of the economy, such as controlling inflation and the sovereign debt, as well as implementing policies that promote a healthy democratic state, such as the independence of justice and the press. Although these policies helped drag the corrupt and kleptocratic governments of 1990s Eastern Europe, most of the heavy lifting was done by the EU funds, which started flowing to these nations in order to help them catch up to their Western peers. Even if these countries had historically struggled with the implementation of the projects that these funds were meant for, they still gave a serious boost to the economies by subsidizing agriculture, the development of infrastructure, digitalization, and so on. The EU has also given the newly democratic nations access to the European free market. The demand of Western Europe for cheap labor, which was plentiful in Eastern Europe, determined multinational corporations to invest in these economies by building manufacturing facilities and open service centers. They have also begun sharing their know-how with the workers in order to boost their productivity and bring up the quality standards of their work. With the newfound experience, many Eastern European workers decided to become entrepreneurs and start their own businesses in order to respond to the unprecedented demand for goods and services of the Western Europe. But this period of rapid growth was cut short by the onset of the 2008 financial crisis. The failure of a couple major US banks triggered a chain reactions that swept the entire world. Companies from Eastern Europe and the Balkans were depending on the demand of goods and services of their Western clients in order to fund their operations. When the liquidity crisis threw the Western nations into recession, their trade volume with the East shrunk drastically. This meant that the companies that depended on the orders from the rich EU nations had lost their most important clients and soon started filing for bankruptcy, which inevitably led to mass unemployment. People who had lost their jobs could no longer support their families or finance their mortgages. All the Eastern European nations have seen during this period a sharp decline in their GDP that took several years to recover. Fast forward a few years and things were finally starting to come together for Eastern Europe and the Balkans. But yet again, the world was thrown into chaos by the 2020 pandemic. I won't go into very much detail here because I'm sure that the memories are still fresh. The invasion of Ukraine by Russia has also hit Europe particularly hard because of their over-reliance on Russian natural gas. Combine this with the sanctions imposed on Russia and it is safe to say that Eastern Europe is not having a great time at the moment. So here we are. We have covered almost 80 years of history for half a continent. So which form of government was better? Centrally planned communist or capitalist democracy? I'll be judging the governing systems on five different aspects, which influence the overall quality of life of the respective societies. Freedom, quality, standard of living, community and culture. Let's start with freedom. Well, under both governing systems, day-to-day -day life is pretty much the same from this point of view. Under communists, you would not be allowed to move or travel to any country outside of the Iron Curtain, with the exception of Yugoslavia. The current democratic system of these countries allow people to move freely to more or less any country that they want, especially in the European Union, and definitely not everyone can afford to do it regularly, and this is even more so true for moving abroad. But this is true anywhere in the world, not just under capitalism. And in a democracy, there is nobody that is outright preventing you from doing it. Under communism, you wouldn't be allowed to protest or to publicly express any negative attitude towards the government. More often than not, elections would be a sham. Or, if things don't appear to go in their way, the rulers weren't above manipulating the results. And if that wasn't enough and people took to the streets, there is a good chance of a brutal military intervention from the other communist states in order to set things right again. A democracy has the advantage that rulers are actually forced to care what people think about themselves and their governing. It is still not a perfect system because, as things are at the moment, people get to vote only on who will lead them, not actually what they want to be done about the country. So they are pretty much forced to hope that the person who they elected will keep their promises, which hardly ever happens. To add to this, it is a very frequent occurrence that all the candidates of a democratic election are unpopular and the people must make the choice of the lesser of two evils. You could argue that this is no better than a dictatorship, but the upside is that every few years you get the chance to try and make things better, instead of just waiting for the current ruler to die and hope that the next one isn't as terrible. This is why I'll be giving the point for freedom to democracy. When it comes to equality, one would be tempted to give the point straight to communism, because that is the entire point of it. But I do want to delve a little bit deeper into the topic before that. It is a widely held belief that in capitalist democracies, people who are born into privilege will have an easier and better life than your average person. But I could argue that the same is true for communism. The children of powerful politicians will always have more money, go to better schools and have more career opportunities than a regular kid, no matter 
under the governing system. The difference lies with the lower and middle classes. I would argue that under democratic capitalism, your overall success in life is much more dependent on luck than it would be under communism. There are a lot of factors which are pretty much outside of your control, which have a deep impact on the results that you are going to get. Your parents' professions, the kind of connections you form during school and university, the market demand for your degree, and so on. In the United States, one of the best predictors for lifelong success is the zip code of the house that you have grown up in. On the other hand, under communism, your life is much more predictable from a certain point forward. Arguably, the determinant moment in your life was the exam at the graduation of high school. The top 10% of people or so, as well as the children of politicians, got to go on studying in higher education, while the rest of the people went straight to work, most likely in factories or farms. Also, when graduating high school, men were sent to mandatory military training for two years. But that's the cold war for you. You are more or less guaranteed to get an apartment around the time you get married and have children. And you would likely afford to buy a car sometime in your 40s, no matter if you were a doctor or a factory worker. Still, this is not the perfect system that some people imagine it to be. This is because a communist economy basically runs on bribes. The more useful you can be to other people, the more bribes you get. And in turn, you can give better bribes to other people in order to get the goods and services that you want. This means getting expensive foods such as meat and oranges, skipping the line at the hospital, or getting a job at the factory that is closer to your home. With all this said, you pretty much never had to worry that you would lose your workplace and be left in the streets while your neighbor buys his third Lamborghini. So I'll be giving the point for equality to communism. When it comes to comparing standards of living, I will try to keep in mind that a lot of the difference comes from the advancement of technology with time, because there is a massive disparity between the 20th and 21st centuries from this perspective. Eastern Europe has seen good times and bad times under both communism and capitalism. The bad times during communists took the form of mass shortages of goods, where people were forced to wait for hours in line in the hopes of getting even the most basic products, such as oil or toilet paper. The decade after the anti-communist revolution has also been very difficult for these societies. They were plagued by massive unemployment, which led to an increase in practices such as human trafficking and prostitution, reduced life expectancy for the population, and increased rates of depression. The dramatic difference that appears between the forms of government manifests within the international support structures that they had access to. At the end of the Second World War, the Warsaw Pact countries refused or were forced to refuse to benefit from the Marshall Plan and they had to rely on the communist bloc for economical aid, if you can call it that. After over three decades of democracy, the Eastern European nations that have joined the EU have closened the gap in purchasing power parity to their richer Western neighbors and they are still consistently outgrowing them. This means that these countries are actually catching up in terms of living standards to countries such as France or Germany. This phenomenon would have been unthinkable during the 20th century under communism. On the other hand, this cannot be said about the formerly communist countries that have chosen to distance themselves from the EU or NATO, such as Serbia or Belarus. Although they have seen significant growth during the same time, it is not to the same level of their EU counterparts. Free markets are the cornerstone of capitalism, and they offer countries the opportunity to create relations which have historically proven to be beneficial for them. Just as on an individual level, capitalism is not a guaranteed path to a better life, but what it does is offer the opportunity for it. And this is why I'm going to give the point for standards of living to capitalist democracies. But what capitalist democracies are terrible at are building communities. All Western economies have ended up building societies that encourage individualism to unprecedented levels through consumer culture. People are always in competition with one another, either for jobs or promotions, for the house or car that they own, for the holidays that they go on, or for the clothes and makeup that they buy. This is not to say that it didn't happen as well under communism, but in Western societies, literally people's worth as human beings is measured by how much money they make, their employment status, or the things that they own. This is made obvious by the fact that we treat people with some of the most important jobs in Western society, such as teachers, as if they were less successful just because they don't make as much money as an investment banker. This unchecked individualism creates a culture of loneliness where people are afraid of asking for help, in fear of being judged or seem as weak. And this has led to the proliferation of conditions such as anxiety and depression throughout the population, but it creates for much better consumers and workers. You have fewer friends and families so that you have more time to work and you spend more money in order to impress people that you don't even like. Under communists, these pressures would not be as present in everyday people's lives. Most of everyone worked in a factory or a farm, drove the same cars, lived in the same type of apartment and had the same furniture and clothes. The state also mandated various activities such as joining the army for men, cleaning the streets of snow or fallen leaves, or going to the countryside to pick up fruit and vegetables. Even if some of you may call this forced labor, these activities gave people the opportunity to spend time with one another and form new relationships and bonds. I feel obligated to mention that all forms of communist government instated a system that encouraged people to spy and report on one another if anyone expressed anti-establishment sentiments, and I believe this couldn't have done any good for the people's sense of belonging and friendship. There was also the fact that there was basically never anything worth watching on television, because all programs were 24-7 state propaganda, and this motivated children to go outside and touch grass instead of spending most of their time on TV. All in all, communism wasn't perfect in cultivating the sense of community within the people, but it still did a far better job than democratic capitalism.
capitalism ever could. And this leads me to the final point of the debate, culture. The philosophy of communism when it comes to art is that art for art's sake is frivolous and it should serve the purpose of inspiring communist ideals within the beholder. This is why, as I've said before, most communist art ends up being plain propaganda. Every communist state had a committee which reviewed any work of writing, painting or movie before they allowed it to be published in order to make sure that it promoted the ideals of the party and that it did not express any anti-socialist sentiment. I'm not saying that there haven't been any great works of art coming from a communist country, but what I am saying is that they were created in spite of the government, not because of it. Art in capitalist countries can also be propaganda. Just look at what Hollywood has been putting out in the past few years. And I honestly believe that this was a great thing about the system. But all in all, I think that it cannot be denied that by volume, the largest export of the West is its culture. And this is especially true for the USA. I am positive that most people outside of the US have watched more movies made in Hollywood rather than in their own country. And America's problems always seem to find a way to becoming the entire world's problems. This year, more democracies will hold elections than at any other point in history. But I still think that around the world, there are a lot of people who care more about the results of the US elections than the ones in their own countries. I am not disregarding their geopolitical significance, but I am positive that a significant amount of the attention that they get is because of cultural exports. Capitalist democracies are incentivized to create art that appeals to the consumer, which I believe leads to better results than the communist doctrine which mandates the mass production of propaganda by its very nature. Even so, given the influence that Western culture has had on the entire planet for the past century, I think that capitalist democracies earn this point by sheer volume, if not anything else. If we draw the line here, when it comes to the factors that influenced the overall life experience of citizens living under either form of government, we can say that capitalist democracies are winning with a score of 3 points compared to the 2 points earned by communism. What we do have to keep in mind is that the arguments have been greatly generalized and there are plenty counterexamples for each of them, because this is obviously a very complex topic. Moreover, I would say that even more important than the form of government is the historical context that these countries find themselves in. Would communists have been more successful if it first appeared in the USA or Canada? I guess we can never know for certain, but feel free to discuss this in the comments at length. Also, I would love to know if you disagree with any of the points made in the video. The last one, which was on the topic of the psychology of communist revolutions, sparked some very interesting discussions. You can check it out right here if you want. I really hope that you enjoyed this one though, and as always, have a great day.